Bonjour and welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture to spice up your relationship with God. Here is your host, Stephanie Roussel, with a guest today. Bonjour. I just had the most delightful conversation and I cannot wait to share it with you. It's an unusual conversation. I am welcoming Messianic Rabbi Aaron Orsbrook. He was born and raised in Southern California and he's known Yeshua his whole life. He used to share about Yeshua to his Jewish and non-Jewish friends in high school. And then at the end of high school, Rabbi Aaron began to feel that there was more to his Jewishness than just Passover and Hanukkah at his atheist grandparents. So he went to a messianic synagogue in Philadelphia, he went on his first trip to Israel, and then his first visit to an Orthodox synagogue. And God was moving in his life, revealing to him that his Jewishness was central to his identity. He even went so far as to begin to live like an Orthodox Jew, and that includes Orthodox rabbinic ordination. And then not long after that, he knew that there was something missing. There was something more. The traditions were great, but he craved for more of the Spirit of God and the love of Yeshua. So he left the Orthodox world and he began to seek a way of living an authentic Jewish life under the leading of the Holy Spirit. And his travels brought him to Israel, where he lived for four years, and then to New York, where he met his beautiful wife, Brooke. And now they have four children together. We'll talk about that. In New York, he was a special education teacher and an assistant rabbi at a messianic synagogue on Long Island. And then after several years of serving in that way, he wanted to pursue a calling being a full-time messianic rabbi. And that is where he is currently leading the congregation of Ohev Israel, just outside of of Washington, D.C. His goal is to see Jewish people come to know Yeshua as their Messiah and to live their lives in service of our Master as Jews who are full of the Spirit of God. It's a joy to welcome him today. We're going to talk about his own story that I just kind of briefly told you about. We're going to talk about his congregation. We're going to talk about his ideas on how um, the Messianic Jews are present in the States, in the world, and then what he believes that the church as a, as a whole needs to learn from Messianic Jews. We're going to talk about the original Messianic rabbis, Peter, John, and Paul, and what it's like to walk in their footsteps today. What is his hope moving forward now that more Jews are coming to faith in Yeshua? We're going to talk about uh, the millennia of history and tradition and identity and the phenomenal blessing that it is for a Messianic Jew, but we're going to talk about the potential pitfalls in the accumulation of man-made traditions and how Rabbi Aaron Orsbrook navigates that. We're going to talk about how we can share Yeshua with our Jewish neighbors as Gentiles. And we, yes, we are going to talk about the situation in Israel and how we can pray for Israel right now. So Rabbi Aaron Orsbrook, truly an honor, a privilege, and a delight to welcome you today on the Gospel Spice podcast. Thank you for having me. It is truly a joy and an honor to have you, really. I've been looking forward to this conversation ever since we met at a uh, Messianic worship conference in Texas a few weeks, a couple months ago or something like that. So um, would you like to bless us first by telling us your own story of faith, please? Sure. I grew up, uh, my parents were believers uh, the time I was born. Um, our journey was one of those we believed in Jesus. Uh, we celebrated our holidays uh, with my grandparents who were atheists. And uh, but we we made it work. We loved each other. We celebrated um, really was to the end of high school. We started to be drawn to, well, what does it really mean to be Jewish and believe in Jesus? Um, at that time, went to college. Uh, and started to really explore this as a time of what college should be, of learning, exploring, discovering. Um, took my first trip to Israel, and it was really a, quite an awakening to see, wow, this is this is mine. Uh, this is my history. These are these are the stones that my people built, uh, and this is the language of of my people, uh, so on and so forth. It really it. it pushed me into reading voraciously, um, 
studying with anyone I could, uh, including do I really even believe this, that Jesus is the Messiah? Because I was I grew up with it, but is this something that was that I take ownership of it? So I would read books that said yes, read books that would said no. And I would say, well, which one makes the most sense? I talked with professors. I went to Israel more. I went to Messianic congregations. I went to traditional Jewish congregations. Um, ultimately, I did believe, yes, this makes the most sense. Um, and it was shortly after college, uh, I ended up moving to Israel. and I lived there for several years, um, which was a whole other experience because this Messianic life in Israel, I mean, life in general is a Jew, uh, but even as a Messianic, is very different there. Um, and I, I really did love it. Uh, I came back to the States and say when I, when I met my wife, uh, who was from New York, joining her congregation uh, was really a deep time of discipleship for me, um, becoming my own man. Uh, what does it mean to not just believe, but then really walk the walk? So it was really a wonderful time of both being with my wife, getting married, starting a family, but also uh, being intimately and uh, deliberately discipled. And it was uh, crucial uh, for me to to make this a, a not just a faith, but a mature one, uh, one that also listens to the spirit um, and not just ideas. Uh, it was several years ago I had the opportunity to uh, become the senior leader of a congregation here in Virginia, Ohev Israel, uh, which has been wonderful. Also, my wife and I work together here. Uh, it's it's uh, it's great. I mean, it's still growing here. I mean, just because I'm the leader, I still got plenty to learn, and I learn as as I teach and help people, counsel, disciple, so forth. Um, but it, it's really been great. Now with our children, that's also a, a huge thing that propels me in the morning. When, when I, well, what does your prayer time look like in the morning? How do I can be a better father? Um, so that's uh, that's that's a pretty good nutshell of where I'm at and uh, where I've come from. I am so intrigued then by your parents' story, you know. And so how are they now approaching your faith? Um, have they grown through your own embracing of what they had raised you with? Um, well, that's a, it's a fascinating question. I mean, certainly it was something we always talked about. And it's, it's kind of neat at times when my parents say, well, will you pray for me? Um, it's, it's been interesting. My, my family's in California. Um, so it's California life is, I know the weather, everyone says the weather's great, but the, the culture there is, is, is a peculiar one. So I, I, it's funny, even as a kid, I, I, I looked for something more. And I, I, that's why I really, as much as I miss the weather in California. I like the East Coast culture more. It, it has stimulated. Yeah, certainly it, it's a, it's unavoidable. It's, I mean, it's my job, if you will. So it's been good uh, to be able to love them and honor them and bless them with what I do now, sharing things with them. And then they, they share with their friends. If we're going to, God willing, this trip will still happen in May to go to mm -hmm. Israel. And they say, well, you should go. If you want to go, go with my son. So it's it's pretty fun, you know, that I uh, have this opportunity uh, to be a blessing to them still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So you said your grandparents were atheists. So that means your parents were the first generation to come to faith. Mm -hmm. And so now you're passing on that baton with your own children. And I can actually so relate to that because I grew up atheist and my husband grew up Muslim. So we're kind of like your, you know, your parents' generation. We're the first ones on either side of our family to come to faith. And now we're raising our children to believe in Jesus and to, you know, and now they're adults and so they've accepted him like for themselves they went through kind of the same journey you're describing of well it's not because my parents taught me you know and even though so I had never thought of um you know messianic believers having to go through that process as a second generation this is absolutely fascinating um so how does that impact how you're leading your congregation today and tell us about your congregation and and what's so unique about it maybe in its approach to the first century culture in Israel and your people. <laughs> the, the congregation's been around for about 40 years. I'm its fourth senior leader since its inception. We're in the DC area, 
uh, Northern Virginia, we have about maybe 30 to 40 percent of our people are born Jewish. People have been here for a long time. People have been here for, you know, they, given it's D.C., we get people who come in and out. But it's great. We have tons of kids with lots of young families. You know, and the way I always try to lead it is just through being really honest, being transparent, being relational, being with people, which I guess has its challenges too, because I sometimes I, I'm someone's friend and then sometimes I'm their rabbi. It's, it's not always an easy road to walk, but because I've developed a trust with people, it, it, it really is, we, we have a, what we, I, we like to call a family. If a, someone said to us, who's been coming for maybe years, said, you know, this is, I've been a believer for many, many years. This is the place where I've, where I've experienced the most love and unity. So that that really is nice. And people really care for each other, which is one of the um, things I'm most proud of. We've made some good inroads into the larger Jewish community, making good friends with people there. We've had the opportunity of having some of uh, a different congregation, a different synagogue come to us. And we had to we talk about who we are. It's been pretty neat going on the on the streets in D.C., sharing about Yeshua, holding events, trying to, I like to try stuff. Uh, we had the Seder at Museum of the Bible in D.C. last uh, last spring. Uh, we've done concerts in D.C. We we try to be creative and innovative and uh, at a very high level, so people are are drawn to it, and then we can have an opportunity to share with them about Yeshua. So it's been pretty cool. We very much believe that the Spirit is alive today, and He works through us. We've seen many many healing miracles uh, in our services, and something we've pursued and want to have. Uh, people are set free both outside the congregation and within. So it's 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 really exciting. We we in as much as we want to look back to the first century, we also I guess in the totality of what we call being a follower of Yeshua, we also want to be much very in the 21st century. It, it, looking at our history, what we've been through as a people, where the Jewish people are because we we can't look back and say well, that's who the Jewish people are 2,000 years ago. We're very different. Most Jews have never read the Bible. They don't know anything about prophecy. They don't speak Hebrew. And so to say, well, if you, didn't you read Isaiah 53? They, but who's Isaiah? We want to be very relevant to the Jewish culture and people of today. And then showing them that very much, particularly now, that to find real hope, to find power, to find purpose, to find a connection to God is through Yeshua. Yeah, the prophecies are great and everything. Um, and if opportunity presents itself, yeah, we love to share, but give people a tangible hope, something demonstrable that God is A, alive, and that B, we can have access to him through the sacrifice and justification of Yeshua. That, that, that's, that's key. And that's where we found a lot of, you know, being very real with people. Jewish people are, they, they tend to be the kind of people that, you, you can't pull a fast one off and pass them. So we try to be very authentic in both our, our faith, uh, our Jewishness, and, and just who Yeshua is, why he's good for Jewish people. I remember a few years ago, we had a dinner party at our house and uh, someone came who was a friend of a friend. I didn't know him personally. And he was Jewish, but very secular. And actually not secular. He was a practicing Buddhist, which grieved me. I, I just, the the sadness of it just choked me. And um, I, I remember asking him, you know, we were literally like clearing the dishes and he was very kindly helping. And he and I were in the kitchen, just the two of us chatting. And he, I asked him like, why don't you aren't you interested in your Jewish heritage? And he said, no, because it's, it's a bunch of lies. I'm like, Oh, tell me more. I'm curious. And he's like, well, it obviously doesn't make sense that God would promise to Abraham never to destroy his people. And then he destroys with the flood and Noah. And I'm like, you've got your order reversed. Noah was before Abraham. And he looks at me with great, big, huge eyes. And he goes, he was, I've always thought that God had lied because he had told Abraham something and then didn't hold up the promise with Noah. He just didn't, didn't even know that Noah was before Abraham. And so I, he, he, you know, he was just very, very curious. And then we haven't been in touch since, but I've, I've been praying for him. It's been years and um, he's an elderly man now that I'm hearing from my friends. So anyway, it, it just comes to mind that the, I was very surprised by the lack of, culture he had of his own history his own i mean which is so unmatched you know the the beauty of your history and your culture and your people is just unmatched so um 
Okay. So I want to, there's so many ways I want to have this conversation because I'm thinking of the people listening to us and watching us, and I'm sure their minds are swirling with questions. And so I'm going to try to take those as I'm imagining they're asking them. First, you're talking about, you know, being a messianic believer in Yeshua as a Jew here today in the 21st century in the States. So can you maybe just for us uneducated Gentiles, tell us a little bit about the state of um, of um, the, the messianic followers of Jesus in America and then maybe in the entire world maybe today. And then I'd love to hear how things are in Israel because you've mentioned you've lived in Israel as a messianic Jew and that's probably its own thing. So if you would kind of just lay the landscape for us uneducated people. In the States, there are several thousand Jewish believers. It de- it depends on how you define Jewish, but it's we've been around. I guess if anyone's seen the Jesus Revolution, that's essentially when it started. Even my own mom, she was uh, in this the movie when they're baptized at Pirates Cove. She was there with Chuck Smith. How interesting! So now there are there are scores of congregations from different networks in the states. Uh, usually, Messianic congregations are about maybe a quarter to a third. Jewish by birth, and then you get a number of people who are feel they could be enamored by it all. There are those who feel called to be part of the people and worship alongside the people. You usually you find them in bigger metropolitan areas, but some are scattered throughout uh, the states, like I know congregations in Montana or Kansas City, for instance. The life is Jewish. You know, the 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 life cycle is Jewish. Some would be more observant than the Jewish tradition. Some would be less. It's quite a variety. Just like you'd find it within inch, the larger Jewish community. It's you know, people say, well, this is what Judaism teaches. Like, well, that's like saying this is what American is. I mean, it's, it's such a variety. Yeah, there are things that hold us together that you find somewhat congruent. Overall, there's still a large variety. The, the biggest, well, in Israel, you have a great population there. It's growing, which is neat. I mean, you see them, they're serving the military, they're in business, uh, obviously in ministry, more and more youth are involved. In Israel, it's a little bit different too, is because Israelis, they they may not necessarily be so desirous that they're going to take it immediately, but they're they're more open to other ideas. In America, a lot of Jews are still well, we are the minority. Essentially, we derive from those who came here, primarily the last great wave of immigrants from Eastern Europe who were persecuted just for being Jewish. And you know, like my family too, we, most of my family was killed by Hitler. And my grandmother even tells a story of our family back in Russia. My great, great, great grandfathers was beat up by Russian soldiers just because he was Jewish. No reason, much like we see today, unfortunately. So they said, we got to get out of here. And in Israel, however, we don't, we're not the minority. And Israelis are much more open to stuff beyond what they see as traditional Judaism. And so it makes it neat. And people are, I mean, when I lived there, it was, it was neat because I would just share with people. And sometimes it's a challenge because I would share, well, this is what I believe in talk about it and they kind of like, okay, that's cool. And then life goes on. So it's kind of a, it has two sides to it, you know, cause it's like, well, we're not going to get combative. On the other hand, it's just one idea of many it seems, but there is a greater hunger because Israelis in general are, are looking for more. Uh, they often go to South America or to India after military service, usually get into drugs and other things. So it's like, well, you know, you can use it. Like if you're looking for a high, there's nothing greater high than being filled with the Holy Spirit. The most high is the greatest high. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Europe, you have a few congregations. The biggest one actually is in Ukraine, which is really, really an amazing place. Uh, South America has a few. But it's neat, too, is that especially in the States, we're finding greater unity amongst the different networks. Where in the past, we were more divided. But getting a greater unity, I think, we're seeing that, you know what, we'll be more effective together. I think it's really neat. Um, so it's nice when we're working together to, of course, we have a, all of us have a burden to reach uh, our people with the news of Yeshua. How we do that differs, but you know, sometimes we just say we can lay aside our differences and just let's go out there and be creative and share with our people. I mean, our congregation, we've done, we've partnered with Jews for Jesus, and sometimes the Jews for Jesus, you know, they're the guys in the, the airports handing out pamphlets. They have such a heart and many years of experience doing this that I said, I, I don't. I, I have looked past the differences because our hearts are the same. We want to share Yeshua and see our people come to faith. So that, that part's been pretty neat, being able to work with them. And then even seeing there are many, many more Jews actually in churches throughout the States. And we do definitely want to see them 
at minimum, still identify as Jewish, still live a life as Jewish. They want to be in a church. I prefer if they're in a Messianic congregation, but if you want to be in church, at least be Jewish there, you know, keep the holidays, you know, eat like a Jew, pray some somewhat like a Jew, um, and find other Jews there and, you know, support each other. Because we do, our calling is in, in name only. It has a specific way of life and it's, it's, it's redemptive. And it's also, it's a privilege and it's exciting. I tell my kids, we, my wife and I, being Jewish is special, you know, so it's not something we take lightly. So we we really encourage people to live that life. It's really interesting because you really, I mean, your people is so unique in the literal millennia of, of history and and such a special relationship with the Lord of identity with him and of uh, of tradition that you're mentioning, you know, all the holidays and all of that. That's an incredible unmatched blessing. Isn't there, however, potentially the pitfall of this accumulation of maybe man-made traditions that would be juxtaposed? And so how do you navigate that? Very carefully. We weigh things, we discern, uh, we process, we pray. Uh, the Holy Spirit, we the Holy Spirit st still speaks to us, and through patience and persistence, uh, we'll be guided. And it's also important why to be in a good godly community with elders. Um, you know, just have one guy leading the show. You're not trying to do this thing by yourself. Um, it, it's and you figure out maybe then you process further. It's uh, does this work? Does it not work? Is it giving us life? Does it lift up Yeshua? Um, does it is it centering on Yeshua? Uh, is the set is the spirit allowed to move in these things, or are we just so focused? And I and I and I and I know I, I've lived it. It's it's uh, it's not always easy. Um, it's not, you know, there's a lot within the Western body is things stemming from, I think, the Reformation uh, that tr man-made traditions are bad. No, some man-made traditions are bad and some are good. You know, for, mm -hmm. on a joking level, like eating hot dogs on July 4th is a great man-made tradition. Uh, but it, it, I'm French. I'm not sure I would agree with that, I, but that's okay. I figured you would. <laughs> Fine. Um, but it... But for us as Jews, yeah, we we have to take uh, the scriptures and use them as a sieve and put in Jewish tradition and see what falls out and not the other way around. And that's all a lot. You're right. A lot of people do that. They say, well, this is Jewish. And well, let's sift through the uh, We'll use that as the sieve for the Bible. No, no, you can't do that. The Bible is the first. Yeshua has to be the center. Um, and the spirit is the one who gives us life, not traditions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Christmas is a man-made tradition, and I don't know anyone who's willing to give it up. So exactly right. Yeah, it's like, were well, you going to tell me that? Oh, well, you don't do that because that's legalism. Well, so is getting. I mean, if you make it, I have to get a tree every year. What's the difference? You know, if you're hard to worship God and to to praise God for the birth of Yeshua, then fine. You know, but if you're if if the, the, the stuff becomes the focus, it's no different. Yeah, I like to compare. You know, the festival of booths, like how weird it is to build. You know, um, you know, a shelter out of branches. Who would do that? Well, is it really any weirder than cutting a tree and putting it in your living room and decorating it with lights? Like, really, is it really weirder? So, <laughs> you know, there's um, there's some really good uh, traditions that we develop and others that just feel weird because they're not our culture, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily bad, but vice versa too. There's some traditions that might feel good yet they're man-made. And so they can be questioned. And that's, that is so interesting. I love, uh, I love to discuss, you know, how culture and scripture intersect. And I think in, in your life, in your world, you, you bump up, bump up against that all the time. I do. There was a time in my life, particularly in college and after college, when I lived a very, what would it look like a very religious Jewish life, uh, even to the point of studying uh, in a very uh, orthodox yeshiva, which is a seminary, and I've lived it. And it was good, uh, looking back, but when people get very uh, enamored by it, enthralled, enticed, um, I understand, but they have to be very, very careful. Um and it's so I, I will talk with these such people and, you know, want to get to know what, why are you doing this? Uh, what is it? What's the purpose? And that really is what it comes down to. And you can also just see people, you know, the, those 
who are filled with the spirit and you look in their eyes and there's, there's a glow, there's, there's life. And that's not necessarily saying that they don't keep any traditions, but then there are those who, who don't have that life. And to me, it's like, what are you doing to feed your spirit? Or are you doing something just to feed your desire, your identity or your, your, uh, uh, your need for something more, which I get it. I mean, that's it's a lot of the challenges in within the Western body of Messiah is that we don't have a lot of identity. We don't have a lot of culture. We don't have a lot of history. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I go to a non-denominational church that was created eight years ago. Like that, that is, that is there's what roots do you have? You know, it's, it's not to say that it's bad, but a human being needs continuity. We need connection. We need historicity. So it, it's, that that part of it's very good. I like it. You know, even so, if we have stuff that that grounds us, that keeps us connected, that's wonderful. It doesn't define us in the sense that we have to do just like our fathers did. Uh, but it, it, we need something that it's something beyond ourselves. You know, I mm. or just a, my wife and I were at a, a Virginia Beach the other weekend. There was a hotel down there, and it said the historic. Cavalier Hotel, and it's a hundred years old. It's a hundred years old. That's not historic, you know. Go to Israel; these these, these stones are eight thousand years old. That, that's it. Yeah, I hear you. I'm French. I we got our share of you know old stuff, and it it does crack me up. I yeah, living in the states, we've lived in the states for eight years, and I I do love American history, and you know we're on the East Coast, so we have beautiful historical. I mean, I'm in Philadelphia, so there's quite a bit of historical stuff, but. Yeah, it's all relative, isn't it? It's interesting. Uh, so question for you, you know, in light of everything you just shared, maybe, or take it any angle you want, what do you think the the church in general, the body of Christ, uh, Gentile mostly, maybe Western, maybe global, you take it anywhere you want to take it. Uh, what do you think the church has to learn from Jewish believers in Messiah? Ah, I could write a dissertation. Well, one thing, let me, let me make this disclaimer. It, it's It's vice versa. I don't want to think that mm-hmm. we have answers, uh, but as far as we we certainly love the church in general, and we we are, we are deliberate about it. when we see something that we don't have, we go after it. I don't care if it's the Jewish, not Jewish. We want to be the grow the fullness of the the, the stature of Messiah. Amen. We we will go. We're one, but we do. Yes, you're right. We do have something particular to offer. One is to see that the body, all believers. Uh, are grafted into Israel. And that's key. Um, you and I both witnessed at the conference, you know, that Israel, not in a sense of superiority, but of just the economy of God is central. And that to be in it, to, to not be connected to Israel is really, I dare say, not to be connected fully to the heart of God. Um, I have to see is grafted into Israel. So I've even with the whole thing going on now in Israel, and people say, well, it's a, it's a Israeli conflict or it's a regional conflict. If you're a believer in Yeshua, it's your conflict because it strikes at his very heart. And that, that's, that's huge. So just saying, well, I identify, I am part of the, the commonwealth of Israel, as you read in Ephesians. That's step one. Step two is that we're not, I'm not against Christmas. I'm not against Easter or the, the Christian calendar. But at least for people to have an awareness of the calendar of God laid forth in Scripture is 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 key. Now there are those who would want to then observe it in some practical ways, but at least being aware of what's happening, because they have significance not just for Jewish people, um, but also for the believers at large and what the God does special things on special days. And so knowing what these special days are, when they are, why they are. Um, and you see that the, its significance for the past, uh, how God is related to the people and to Israel, which also shows God's character for how it relates to us as the all, all believers in Yeshua, and what he's doing today, and then also what he will do in the future, namely with Yeshua's return, which is really programmed through the fall holidays. as he fulfilled, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right, he fulfilled the spring holidays in his first coming. And we'll do so literally uh, in, in with the fall festivals. So, you know, people say, well, we don't know the day or the day or, or hour. Yeah, Yeshua does say that, but 
He gave us a lot of signs. Yes. Oh, come on. He tells us to recognize the season. I mean, how, how clear is that? There's the season. And he's and because people, oh, we're going to go all go to heaven. Well, no, we're actually, Yeshua is going to come to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So to, to, understand, to be aware, to be connected, uh, I think those are the probably the biggest things. And I also think, which could segue into another thing, is that people having a, a, a heart and a burden as Paul mentions in Rome in Romans 9, that hit a passion to see Jewish people come to know Yeshua. You know, he goes so far as this, I wish myself were accursed if it would save my people. That's a strong mm -hmm. statement. Uh, but that if that were the heart of every follower of Yeshua, Jew and Gentile, you know, it's, um, three times in Romans 11, if we were to provoke Israel to jealousy, uh, not with Christians, yeah, yeah. not with doctrines, but with the love of Messiah and the power of Messiah, you just can't go wrong with that. I mean, if the rejection led to the salvation of so many Gentiles, what will the acceptance by the Jews mean? I mean, but, you know, new life and, and fullness of abundance. And um, that's very obvious. And, and I, I understand what you're saying. And I'm thinking at the same time, you know, my my family is completely atheist and absolutely not Jewish. I mean, just typical secular French people. And my husband's family is all Arab. And we, we have that same longing for our own families of origin to come to faith, even though they're not Jewish. So even more so, I would say, um, I mean, Yeshua came in a very clear a cultural context. And that's very special. I know for me, uh, my faith has grown by leaps and bounds when I've discovered the Jewish heritage of the Gospels and to learn to read and experience the Gospels through the lens of uh, the, the Jewish identity. And, and it just is, it's an incredible blessing, it really is. And so it's, I, I, I desire that for even our, our our fellow believers in Christ who are not Jewish, like I, like you know, for I want everyone to discover the depth of intimacy with God that comes from understanding and from you, even as an outsider, you know, but from understanding that very special connection and culture. So it's it's really special. I think when we see a lot of Jewish history is marred by the fact of of persecution and indifference uh, a lot within Europe. And then if, obviously we see a lot within the Muslim world. And we, a apropos to your statement, you know, when you see those who were once considered our enemies now saying, we love you and we support you, that speaks volumes. Now Israel has so many enemies. You see, even just look at the UN votes, just it's disgusting. And so mm -hmm. someone says, we, we reject that and we love you. We stand with you. Uh, we support you. You know, we love your God. We love your Messiah. Uh, that, that That's huge. You know, we yeah, give money and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I mean, what people need is is eternal hope. Uh, so it, it just speaks. It's such a huge testimony. Like there's a remember the guy at the conference who is a, a Palestinian uh, who came to faith and he just loves, loves Yeshua. He loves the Jewish people. He's not ashamed of it. I'm sure he gets backlash from his community all the more so now, but he's not ashamed. You know, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, that yeah. speaks, that says so much to our people. Yeah, my husband relates to that. He has interesting family conversations um, these days at home, back, you know, on the phone. So, yeah, speaking of that and what's going on right now. So we're recording today, November 3rd. Uh, this episode is going to air very quickly. I really want this out next week. And so very, in the next few days, it's going to come out. Um, how would you recommend that we pray for Israel right now and for the whole situation and even for the Palestinian people, obviously, mm -hmm. and, and, and to pray the way Yeshua is leading you to pray for the situation? Multifaceted. Uh, in Ezekiel 37, it talks about... Uh, 37 i think so where the god's god's name would be exalted and i think which we know is means a few things one is that god israel succeeds and continues to exist that god would be praised and i want to see that you know i want to see our soldiers protected that our government would have wisdom the generals have wisdom uh, but ultimately that our people would see you know in times of crisis in the past in the book of judges it said they cried out to god and god answered them and sent them a judge and that their people ultimately would see the truth the, the truest of judges the ultimate judge yeshua uh, because this is this going to stop no unfortunately it really breaks my heart hamas islamic jihad hezbollah iran they're they're not going to stop and the scripture says it too so it, it's imperative that our people see Yeshua, who will lead us to the ultimate of victories, and will do so for the glory of God. Uh, likewise, for the 
the people of Gaza who are really the greatest of the victims. They are. Oh, <laughs> they're all hostages in many ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Israel said, get out. And Hamas said, no. And the poor people, you know, Israel said, oh, well, we'll, uh, we'll shut off your electricity and water. Just release the captives. Hamas says, no. So the people suffer and it's horrible. You know, I, one of my prayers is what they perhaps be safe physically, but two, they pray for Yeshua to be revealed, that they could see that there's a man in white, that they, you know, just much like, yeah. like the in Babylon. That there's a fourth man and they're with them as they suffer. You know, they, they, the Hamas they, it is the worst for the Palestinian people. The worst. They, they persecute their own people just as much as they persecute Israelis. Yeshua clearly is the only solution. I mean, if, get those people out of harm's way. Let Israel do its job. Let Hamas, as soon as, honestly, as, as Hamas is destroyed, the Israelis can live at peace more, and so can the Palestinian people. And there's also, if we be very deep about it, pray for wisdom on how to handle what will happen to Gaza afterwards, what to do. It's unfortunate, you know, the people suffer because the situation, the the war uh, needs a lot of guidance, and the love of God, and that Israeli, the messianics there, including in the military, can be a shining light to the community who are also, a lot of the Israelis, not just suffering physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Uh, Yeshua is the only one who can heal them ultimately. Uh, you know, as, as hard as it is, it's often in these situations uh, that makes people the most receptive uh, to something that they've never experienced. So this can be prime time really for a great harvest of people into uh, the kingdom of God. I love the hope there. And I completely agree with you that Yeshua is really the only solution, but he's more than sufficient to the task. And when we say he's the only solution, it's not in a dejected sort of way, but it's actually the most hopeful thing we can say and the most ambitious and the bravest and the most beautiful thing that we can say is to declare that he really is the solution. So you were talking about Paul earlier, and um, I wonder what it's like to be a rabbi in the footsteps of Paul in a way, right? As a Messianic Jew being a rabbi, I mean, I'm just curious, uh, you know, you're in the footsteps of, you know, you and all, all, you know, all Messianic rabbis. I'm just, I'm not putting you specifically on a pedestal necessarily. I'm just saying, you know, Peter and John and Paul, and they were the original Messianic rabbis who then, uh, that God used to launch the world on fire for him. Him. And um, how, how, how? What hope do you have for the fact that? I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that in our generation, more than ever, there is again this intermingling of Gentiles and Jews in the church in the body of Christ. I find that beautiful. So um, I don't know. I mean, it seems. Is it correct to say that there's a, uh, a there's more Jews coming to faith in Yeshua than ever before? Would that be an act outside of you know the first hundred years? You know, uh, would that be a decently accurate statement? And if so, how does that give you hope for the future? Yeah, I we do see a great openness. I wouldn't say they're 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 coming in like they're open, the floodgates are open, but mm-hmm. I find that there's a, a softening. For instance, my just recently my. Uh, my wife's parents uh, both prayed to receive Yeshua, which is wonderful. And she's also had a lot of opportunity because of what's happening in Israel to talk with people about faith. And now they have no more believers from years, but there's a receptivity to it. Even as we've gone out and talked with people, I've, I've, I've had conversations with even very religious Jews, just an openness uh, um, to have a conversation. I, it's it's not exactly where I want it to be, but to see this is very hopeful. Even there was a Jewish organization recently. I had a conversation with uh, one of the executive directors of this place, and they had a, a vigil for Israel a few weeks ago. And he and I have been friends for some time. And we met at the gym. I mean, it wasn't it's just talking, just have a conversation. And he said, you know, when we're creating the list of those whom we'd like to invite to this uh, vigil, I thought about you. Ultimately, I, my board said I can't do it because I wanted you there in one respect. But if you were there, I would have detracted from the reason for being there, which was to pray for Israel. And I said, I understand. It's unfortunate, but I get it. But the fact that he even thought about this and that he presented it to his board, it, it, it was remarkable. You know, I was stunned that, that he would go to bat for me in a way like that. But it shows me that God is, you know, is the greatest patience of us all. That he's he, he's working through people, and so I think through relationship, through loving people, through inviting people, through engaging with people, through giving. We've just people have we've had some cousins said, "Would you give to this organization?" Like asking us 
You said sometimes it's funny is that people think, well, our money is like stained or dirty. It's like, no, it's still green. Same money as yours. So for them to even ask from us, that's a big deal. So I see just an openness and it, it is exciting. That encourages me to be able to you know, keep going because this is a buddy of mine from Jews for Jesus said, sharing with Jewish people is, is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And personally, I'm not a long distance runner. I don't like, I used to play basketball. I like sprinting. So this is hard. But I know that God is doing, is working in our people. Well, I'm I'm really excited to hear that your what your your wife's parents have come to faith. That is is beautiful news, and you know it makes it really personal because uh, it's wonderful to hear of people coming to faith in general. But when you when there's a personal connection, it's very very special. Assuming that in your congregation you have people maybe like Brooke's parents who are new to the faith, and maybe you have people who have been in the faith as you've mentioned for a very long time, maybe generations, um, and then you have I'm assuming some Gentiles who come in, and so you have an incredibly diverse congregation to pastor. So, um, I mean, I've never really had the opportunity to talk with a, um, a, a rabbi like this. So I'm just, I just have questions uh, about, for example, like when you pastor your congregation, what does that look like? And maybe what are some of the shepherding roles that you have that are specific to the fact that you are a messianic congregation and not just quote unquote, a regular church? Well, we try to, we have, we have a board of a group of elders, which is key. And I think this is also important is going back, uh, seeing Jewish ways of governance, what's in, a lot in scripture, which I hope would be, would influence a lot of, of the different churches out there and uh, seeing that there's good, we thrive under good governance. Uh, we have Shamashim or deacons. And honestly, a lot of it, I just, I use the model that's in scripture with, uh, Ethel, Jethro, and his and his son-in-law Moses, setting up different leaders over different systems or levels of uh, the congregation. So more and more, I find myself, you know, really ministering to those who are in upcoming leadership, uh, to those who leave our chavarot, which are our home groups, um, and then like, yeah, we do take down people, couples, perhaps, or individuals who need counseling, talking with them. Um, praying for people, but more and more trying to delegate authority, uh, equip them to pastor, to shepherd, to pray for the flock. And, and because when more, more leaders are equipped, uh, the more people we can touch and bless and, and, and disciple. Uh, this is not about me. I'm just the team captain, uh, but it's about the, the, the whole team functioning well. Uh, so it's it's hard. I'm the kind of guy I like to do it myself and have my hands in everything, but I get burnt out. And so I say, you know what, how can we do this better? Um, and so I, I realized this is, this is the way it's going to do the best is that when we have more people investing in the leaders who can then invest in everybody else and then see what's going on, always taking a pulse and things. It's it's not only is it, it, it blessed the congregation, but I'm blessed and looking and say, wow, this is, I used to teach school. I'll give you an example, but back in New York, I taught elementary special education. And one of the marks of a what we call the highly effective teacher was that the kids know what to do. And they know when to do it and they know how to do it. So you inculcate within them, this is what's going to happen. This is how you do it. This is when you, you're kind of the overseer. And when the kids have a greater level of self-sufficiency and automation, uh, you know you're doing well. And that's that's very much what I'm trying to do in our congregation. Rabbi Aaron Osbrook, before I ask you to close and pray for uh, people listening and, and watching, how can we be praying for you and your family, your congregation? First, I want to keep it personal. And I mean, you've given us some tips on how to pray for Israel, but for you personally, your family, your congregation. That's really sweet. Wisdom, what to do, what not to do, how much to take on personally. I I always have to remind myself that my kids are my first disciples, and I don't want to put the ministry above them. Remind us of their ages. Nine, eight, five, and two. Whew. Yesterday, we, we went outside and we played, all six of us, and one of the neighborhood kids, we live on a cul-de-sac, which makes it easier. We played hide and seek all together. And was there stuff to do? Yeah, there was stuff to do, but it was <laughs> it was really fun so making time for that 
not overcommitting myself and making time. I know this sounds funny, making time for God and not just doing stuff for God. It's hard. You know, it's one thing I've loved about school is that here's my day. It's planned. Here's started at eight o'clock, goes to three o'clock. I'm done. But now it's I, I, I could work 24 hours a day. And that's really difficult. So just wisdom, putting things in priority, uh, being with my wife, my kids, resting personally, and just grace for how to minister to the congregation. Those would be good prayer points. I will be praying for you in that matter. And my husband, I'm sure, will be joining me. And then uh, I hope, you know, I'm inviting our audience to, to be prayerfully considering you and your family. Thank you for that. And would you mind closing us in prayer, please? Thank you. Father, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you uh, for Stephanie and the podcast. I pray it would, you disseminate it, that uh, you would be glorified in it. People would draw, become more like Yeshua, more like Jesus. I have a heart of your same heart. Lord, we be, your body be unified as you prayed in John 17, that we would be one as you and the Father are one. Uh, I pray for the, uh, more love, that we would, people would know that we're your disciples by the way we love one another, and especially in a world now filled with so much hate and violence and evil. Mm -hmm. uh, may your love be showcased, and may it change the hearts and convert our enemies to be our brothers. Uh, strengthen your body, Lord, that the head may be glorified. and. Uh, pray your kingdom would advance, Lord. We know that the light shines in the darkness and darkness has not overpowered it. And uh, may it do so in our different congregations uh, so your kingdom may go forward. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Thank you so, so much for being with us today. It has been a tremendous blessing to me and I know it will be to those who are going to be joining us. Thank you so, so much, really. Thank you very much. Hi, Jonah here. Thank you for being part of the Gospel Spice family. If you've enjoyed this episode, you will love receiving our newsletter. It contains value-packed free gifts and rich content each month. It's at gospelspice.com slash sign up. There is always something new and exciting happening around here, and I don't want you to miss out. Sign up at gospelspice.com slash sign up. Did you know Gospel Spice has a YouTube channel? There's exclusive content there too, so join Gospel Spice on YouTube. Also, please give us a star rating and a comment on your podcast listening app. Your reviews actually really do make a difference to help others discover and experience Gospel Spice. As always, we are praying for you. You can confidentially email us your prayer requests and praise items at the email address contact at gospelspice.com. It's our privilege to pray for you. So, I'll leave you with four things to do. Please pick one and do it at your convenience. One, sign up on our website for our newsletter to receive gifts you're going to love. Two, find us on YouTube and see what content we've put together to help you grow closer to Jesus. Three, rate Gospel Spice on your listening app. It's one of the easiest ways to share the gospel. And finally, four, tell us how we can pray for you. Merci. Merci.